like to get the meeting started. So uh, we'll officially call the meeting to order. Um, good evening, this is Andy Stack, Chair of the CA Board of Directors. Um, please remember that this meeting is being streamed, live streamed. Uh, the agenda and background information for tonight's meeting is available on the CA webpage at uh, www.columbiaassociation.org slash about us slash leadership slash board of directors. And I encourage you to follow along using these documents. I want to remind everyone to please mute your microphones or, unless you're speaking. Please be courteous to each other. When you do speak, please state your name so everyone knows who is speaking. And speak clearly and slowly that everyone can hear you. Um, we'll try to introduce each item on the agenda. Um, and uh, I will try to restate any motion before a vote is taken. Uh, I'd now like to call the roll. Janet? Here. Shari? Here. Jenny? Yes. Dick? Present. Lynn? Here. Nancy? Here. Jess? Here. Alan? Mostly here. Renee? <laughs> Only somewhat here. Milton? Here. And Andy. All, so we're all here. Thank you for coming out tonight. Um, all right. Announcement of closed or special meetings. There were several of them. There was a closed work session of the Board of Directors on July 2nd. Uh, in attendance were Dick, Renee, Jess, Lynn, Alan, Nancy, Jenny, Chari, and Andy. The vote to close was 9-0-0. Um, it was closed under section one discussion of matters pertaining to employees and personnel. Uh, meeting was closed at 7.05 and opened at 8.55, and the purpose was to discuss personnel matter. Uh, there was a meeting of the Risk Management Committee, closed meeting of the Risk Management Committee on 9 July. Um, committee members were uh, uh, Jess, Susan, Milton, Richard, and Lynn. Um, the vote to close was 5-0-0. It was closed under Section 4, consultation with staff, personnel, consultants, attorneys, board members, or other persons in connection with pending or potential litigation or other legal matters. Uh, Meeting was closed at 6.02 and opened at 6.48 p.m. Um, first of the meeting was to review the general liability risk management program status and claims activity. There was a closed meeting in the Architectural Resource Committee on Monday, July 13th. Uh, Deb, Deb Bach, Ed Gordon, Ann McKissick, Carl McKinney, and Sh Sherry Fanneroff were all in attendance. The vote closed was 500. Uh, it was closed under section four consultation with staff, personnel, consultants, attorneys, or other persons in connection with pending or potential litigation. Uh, meeting was closed at 106 p.m. and uh, opened at uh, 2 o'clock, 2, 2 p.m. Per reason, uh, purpose for closing was discussion of new and ongoing covenant cases. There was a closed work session of the CA Board of Directors on the 16th of July. Um, Dick, Jess, Lynn, Janet, Alan, Milton, Nancy, uh, Jenny were all there, and Andy were all there. Um, Renee and uh, Shari joined us a little uh, shortly after the meeting started. The vote to close was 8 0 0. Uh, everyone except Renee and, and Shari uh, was closed under section four and section six. Four's consultation with staff, personnel, consultants, attorneys, board members, or other persons in connection with pending or potential litigation. And then consideration of terms and conditions of a business transaction. Um, meeting was closed at 6.05 p.m., opened at 6.45 p.m., and the purpose was discussion of a potential contract and legal issue. Uh, and there was a closed meeting. The, Audit committee on July 20th. Uh, committee members were uh, Dick, Renee, Janet, Tim, and Jim. The vote to close was 5 0. 
It was closed under section one and four discussion of matters pertaining to employees and personnel in consultation with staff personnel, consultants, attorneys, board members, or other persons in connection with pending or potential litigation or other legal matters. Meeting was closed at 8.13 p.m. and opened at 9.54 p.m. for the meeting. Uh, Allen review of internal controls and other communications with the Office of Audit and Advisory Services. <laughs> that is all of the closed meeting announcements I have. Um, is there a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Jenny, Jenny moved. moved. And Nancy seconded? I'll second, yeah. But then I'd like to discuss. All right. <laughs> I would just like to add the topic that I sent to the board, even though I don't know how to use that little form. Um, just very quick, brief little thing at the end of the meeting about health issues and using facilities uh, during the 55 plus hours. Yep, we're gonna, we're gonna bring it up under the item number 11. Did you give it, Thank you gave it the form. Thank you. Sure. Oh. All right. Andy, um, Andy. Jenny. Uh, uh, under the consent agenda, I would just like to make a clarification of approval of the minutes. The minutes of June 25th. Uh, is it like a typo? No. Okay, well, in that case, we'll need to um, schedule mm -hmm. those at a later date. So if you could send us the change so we know what. No, no, ne never mind that. I was just going to clarify the statement there, but it's not worth it. Go ahead. All right. Um, Andy, yes, um, I do have a correction to the minutes. We haven't approved them yet, I believe. No, we haven't yet. Okay. Um, I have, a, like. I I have a, corre a correction to line 166, 167. Or Are something? we in discussion of minutes now? No, we're not in discussion of minutes. Oh, I'm sorry. I jumped ahead. All right. We'll take the minutes off of the consent agenda. Um, we're still at approval of agenda. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> All right. So um, anybody object to the agenda with the change? Yes. All right. Alan? Oh, all right. Yeah, I'll, take I, the vote. Well, I'll take the vote. Well, I'll take the vote. I, I want to just state that uh, at discussion, uh, I, I'm going to ask, are, are there people from the public who are allowed to be part of this and spontaneously do resident speak out as they have in the past? No, we have three people signed up for resident speak out. Okay, then as I said before, I can't approve any agenda yeah. that doesn't allow for that. Sure. So I will not be approving right. this agenda. All right, I'm going to take the vote on the agenda. Janet? Yes. Shari? Yes. Jenny? Yes. Dick? Yes. Lynn? Yes. Nancy? Yes. Yes. Jess? Yes. Alan? No. Renee? No. Andy? Yes. All right. Agenda's approved. Um, so what I'd like to do next is go to residents speak out. And we do have three residents who have signed up. Um, the first is uh, uh, Kurt uh, Blowjet. Um, so Drew, if you could bring up Kurt. All right, I'm working on that now. I remind everyone to please mic mute your your microphone if you're not speaking Hello, Kurt, you there? 
Yeah, I'm here. Welcome, Kurt. How is everybody? It's your time. Okay. Um, basically, I thank you guys for allowing me to speak out on this. I don't know who really makes a lot of the rules. I've been going to the gym for six years here. And um, part of the 5 a.m. gym group. But what's going on right now at the gym is really unacceptable. Um, we do not have... Uh, an enforced mask policy and masks really should be worn all the time to protect the members and the staff. If we think about it, the staff have to wear them all the time, so why shouldn't the members? I work out there uh, and I'll wear a mask the entire time. Most people do wear masks the whole time, but there are a few people that will not and they take them off, leave them off, wear it as a chin strap, etc. A uh, decision has been made um, by CA to take off masks during strenuous activity. The unfortunate part of that is that when that is opened up for customer interpretation or, or member interpretation, they wear them as a chin strap or only when the staff is looking. Um, we're having a problem with the staff not doing what they need to do, spending an inordinate amount of time policing the members who should be wearing a mask. Um, it's we put partner in the champ thing and i mean i've watched this i was the first one back in the door the morning we opened on that saturday and we're not partnering with our staff if our patrons are not wearing a mask as well uh the cdc guidance says wearing a cloth face covering is most important when physical distancing is difficult and when an exercise type uh when exercise type and intensity allows I'm going to tell you right now, and I had this discussion with one of the staff members there, there's nobody doing any activity at that gym so intense that they cannot wear a mask. Um, if you feel it's causing you that much difficulty breathing, this is not the right time for you to be returning to the gym. The options of walking outside, running outside, jumping rope outside, doing aerobics classes at home uh, are all options that are viable to you. Um, if you allow somebody to take a mask off, in the gym, you negate the entire mask policy. If I am COVID positive and I walk into that gym, I don't know that I'm COVID positive, and I go and I start doing workouts and I take my mask off to do anything, I have now infected that gym. It has now happened in West Virginia. 209 people are quarantining at a planet from a Planet Fitness, and the entire Equinox gym clubs are wearing masks and gloves all the time because five of their clubs have had <clears throat> outbreaks, excuse me. Um, and uh, they're now mandating the entire time because they had the same policy as we have where you can take your mask off for strenuous activities. Um, I've had a friend die, a client die, and I have had a fellow Spartan racer of mine get COVID and we're talking about a 215 pound guy with single digit percent body fat come out of a coma weighing 60 pounds less and johns hopkins did a study on him he's here in he's from washington dc and he woke up in johns hopkins in baltimore uh five weeks later uh, on a ventilator off of a ventilator um i really don't know what we need to do to get this enforced but it's I see it as a really big problem if somebody comes in. It's only going to get more difficult once we go into the wintertime. Thank you, Kurt. Let me ask if any of the board members have any questions. Does anyone have any questions? I have one. I would like him to spell his last name, please. I'm sorry. You broke up on that. What was that? Uh, could you spell your last name, please? Sure. B is in boy, L O. D is in David, G-E-T-T. G-E-T-T. Thank you very yep. much. My Any pleasure. For Kurt? Yeah, actually, I have one question. Um, uh, oh, yes, sorry. Jen? Oh, Janet Jan can go ahead. Go ahead, Jess. Oh. Jess and then Janet. Oh. Really, my question was going to be that if Dan is on the call, which I think he probably is, if he has any thoughts on this and whether, you know, it, it is something that if we were to change that policy that would be enforceable. Uh, 
We oh. don't generally do this during resident speak out, though. Yeah. Oh, let's, um, let's, well. Yeah. Well, we can take. Pay, I mean, we can. Yeah, let's let staff figure out a response. Okay. Well, I guess then my comment is I would love to hear a response from staff as to whether they think it would be feasible to change the policy and, you know, what what the sort of pros and cons of that would be. Okay. Janet? Yeah, I was curious. I'm not sure. I haven't been back to the gyms, to be honest, but I wasn't sure. Do we currently uh, – are they currently taking temperatures as people go in? Nope. They are not. Um, I'm there every morning just about, uh -huh. and they are not taking no temperatures. Um, there's not any requirement to even sanitize your hands on the way in. Um, and, and to be honest, I mean, I just, we're a private club in all intents and purposes, and I have a private business in D.C. You can't come in my business without a face mask, and actually, because it's, it's, uh, there is uh, sensitive information and things. You have to actually take down your face mask, look into a camera, put your face mask back on, and then you can enter. We're entitled to make whatever precautions, precautionary measures are best for us. And as a paying member of the club, that's why, I mean, we talk about it in the mornings at the gym. There's been so many of us that have been there so many. I mean, you can see my check-in list. <laughs> from when I've been there and I'm there every morning my neighbors are there every morning some have asked not to come back because they there's no mandatory mask policy I mean Delta Airlines has it and you're sitting in a seat why should we allow somebody to expel more air and more forcefully into a smaller location with people and as I said as it gets towards winter it's going to become even more difficult I don't want to close down. That's my thing. I want to make it as safe as possible so we don't have any more disruptions. Sorry. Now, Kurt, thank you so much for coming in tonight and for um, bringing this to our attention. And I just want to offer my condolences to you. It's, it's, um, it's very hard when you lose friends. We have lost a family member as well. Um, I did want to ask whether um, there are any signs up near the equipment, particularly the, uh, the treadmills and such, that uh, ask people to remember to wear masks. There are signs that say wear a mask when, I believe it says when appropriate <laughs> or when necessary. And it, it says there are some new signs that say wear a mask when you're not physically doing anything distant like physically um doing an activity but it's just it's not enough i mean we're learning more and more about this every day and like i said my goal is to stay open as as a gym and those of us that do go and and i'd be glad to take this offline i don't want to take all of your time to do this this is your really your meeting um, but there are a bunch of us that go every morning that have been going every morning for many years that we see what can be done and what can't be done. And so I don't know how many of you guys are back to the gym, but being there makes all the difference in how you feel and how you see other gym and club members interacting and, and, uh, following protocol. Thank you. Thank you so much. Jenny, you're welcome. Yeah, um, yeah. Thanks, Kurt, for, for uh, coming. I'm at the gym every day, and I think he has uh, an, a point that could be interesting in terms of you get a spray bottle and a rag, but I guess maybe telling us we need to use that spray bottle on our hands right away, or sanitize, or having something right at the door where we just um, clean our hands right away may not be a bad idea, frankly. Um, other than that, um, people are, in, at least at the Supreme, walking around with the masks on, I think, 100%, at least what I've seen. And the only, the only time they're not is when they're on a treadmill or a bike, and that's after they've cleaned it down, they 
take the mask down and then they use the machine and then they clean it down again. Then before they get off the machine, you put your mask back on. So you're not allowed to walk right. without the mask on. We do I see most of the people, most of the people have the mask on when they're walking around. There are some that need reminding on a daily basis, but that's probably 30% of the issue. And what we've seen with COVID is that it, trans it is transmitted through the air more than even on hard surfaces. And I think we've made these rules when we were coming into the, the precautionary stage of cleaning and hard surfaces and whatnot. What we're now realizing is that somebody could sit in a room of 20 people, and if they are a super spreader and, and they are COVID positive with anti uh, asymptomatic, taking that mask off, can infect the entire room and that happened in one restaurant with nine people so these are all cases and that's that's what happened at another gym and that's why I have a friend who lives in LA and Equinox in Southern California is the one that actually they shut their doors for a period of time and had to now everybody has to have plastic like latex gloves and a mask in order to enter and neither come off the entire time you're in the gym because they had five gyms have outbreaks. Renee? Um, I just, I wanna thank you for coming today and to reiterate um, your request. I think it's awfully important for people at the gym to be wearing a mask. Um, I personally uh, canceled my account just because of the mask issue. Um, and it's important for the board members to know that when someone is COVID positive and asymptomatic, that they can leave their droplets out in the air and they can last six hours or more. And so even if somebody goes at five in the morning and you're going at 10 or 11, you can still be infected by that person. Thank you, Renee. And I appreciate that because it's, it's, that's the biggest concern of mine. Um, can I, and I can't unfortunately see the board, but I guess the most, uh, impactful statement I can probably make is that by our rules right now, we can put 20 people in the free weight area of Columbia gym mm -hmm. and they can all lift on a, an object and they can all have a mask off. Would any of you feel comfortable being in that situation? That's my question. That's, and that's the, it's kind of taking it to the extreme, but that's what the, that's what the rules allow. And I personally admit, am not going to be comfortable going into a place, nor do I think our sh community should be comfortable going into a place that allows 20 people or 30 people, even if you expand it out further to the, to the exercise equipment that can allow 20 or 30 people, if they're moving an object to have a mask off. Okay. Thank you, Kurt. Appreciate your speaking out tonight absolutely thank you everybody have a good evening you too. Uh, bye -bye. Next, next up we have uh rosalind uh daner all right i'll get him on the call Rosalind, you there? Might have lost them. Yes, I am. There we go. Uh, uh, welcome, Rosalind. This is Andy Stack. Um, thank you for speaking out before the CA Board of Directors. Um, your turn. Okay, so um, we are new to the Columbia, Maryland area, and this is actually 
uh, the first meeting that we're attending, and, and I'm not exactly sure, you know, what in terms of community speak out, what questions are kind of on the table or off the table. Um, I did have a question regarding uh, two of the line items that were in uh, the budget for 2020. If that is something that is usually addressed at this meeting, please let me know. Uh, you can certainly ask your questions and we can always re uh, respond to you later. We okay. All right. So there were just um, a couple of line items that I had a, a, a question on. Um, on the technology supplies and expenses, there were um, some pretty large increases from the 2019 uh, fiscal year 2019 actuals and uh, the same for insurance and taxes. So I was just wondering whether or not there was any additional detail behind those two specific items and um, maybe what the additional monies were, were for. Okay, we'll try to get the information to you. Okay, that would be fine. So that was it. And, uh, you know, again, we're new to Columbia, so hopefully we make our transition <laughs> smoothly. Well, so. welcome to Columbia. Uh, let me ask if any of the board members have any questions. No, it doesn't look like it. So uh, thank you, uh, Rosalinda. Okay, thank you. And our next uh, speaker will be Steve Snellgrove. Welcome, Steve. Welcome, Steve. Good Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, this is Andy Stack. Oh. Uh, thanks for uh, calling in for Resident Speak Out. Uh, please, uh, please go ahead. We appreciate that. And, and uh, in, in deference to the conversation, I understand that you normally, this is a, a, a five minute conversation, but I, I might take a little bit longer if that's acceptable to you. Yeah, please go. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chairman Sack and members of the Board of Directors, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Again, my name is Steve Snellgrove, and I'm the president of the hospital uh, here at Howard County General. I'm here to clear up some misperceptions and some misinformation about Symphony of Light. The main message that I want to leave with you is that this legal action threatens a cherished and time-honored family holiday experience. Couples have become engaged during Symphony of Light. A woman has given birth there, and three generations from station wagons annually welcome the holiday spirit that is created by this event. Legal action also jeopardizes an important funding source for the hardworking caregivers at Howard County General Hospital at a time when they need the community's support most of all. I'll cover a little background about which you are probably familiar with, but others who may be watching or listening may not know about. This event was started 25 years ago and has served as a major fundraiser for Howard County General Hospital. It has always been a drive-through event, so that's what the community wants and expects. Also, given the time of the year and the unpredictability of the weather, a walk-through only event would likely lead to cancellations and disappointed community members. For most of the last quarter century, things have run very smoothly with great cooperation between the Columbia Association, Meriwether, and major landowners like Howard Hughes and General Growth Properties, and tens of thousands of families have been entertained. Historically, Symphony of Light operated in what were the parking lots of Meriwether Post Pavilion, undeveloped areas of the property known as the Crescent. The Columbia Association has historically recognized the value of this event for the hospital and charged a nominal $5 annual fee as part of the agreement to use some of its property. Change began in 2015 when we needed to pause the event while we invested about a half million dollars 
to refurbish displays and retrofit them with more than 350,000 LED lights. We knew that funding, which could have been used for patient care, could provide a major return on investment and keep this event contemporary and fresh. By the time of the 2016 holiday season rolled around, the Inner Arbor Trust was fully operating with an important mission to create community programming in Symphony of Woods by generating revenue where it could. Symphony of Lights, however, unfortunately from the hospital's vantage point, was targeted as one of those sources of revenue. The trust initially requested half of all proceeds from Symphony of Lights and then a $50,000 fee for access to certain limited easements compared with the previous $5 charge. Our foundation staff at the hospital had already begun to recognize that in order to grow our fundraising efforts to help our doctors and nurses and patients, other annual events were also needed, such as our Heroes in Healthcare Gala, now in its third year. Symphony of Light takes so much time and staffing to run, so with the approval of our Board of Trustees, we decided to put out a request for proposals to interested parties who would lease or purchase our lights, our trademark name, and provide an annual financial return to the hospital by returning a portion of the proceeds. We completed a competitive bid request for proposal in 2019. The Inner Arbor Trust submitted a bid, but it was deemed to be not responsive. The other bidder could not complete the can transaction, so we did not select anyone from the RFP process. Last year, we asked event consulting and management the local company that had operated the, ev the event for the past 25 years to run the event again, and they did a great job. And we'd like them to do it again this year. Effectively, it's the same arrangement that has been in place for years with the company receiving money for their costs and services and the hospital receiving resources for patient care. I want to be clear about a couple of the points and, and clear up some misconceptions here. Symphony of Lights absolutely continues to be a vet, an event that benefits the caregivers and, and staff at Howard County General Hospital as well as our patients. I've read that some people are saying this is no longer a hospital event, that a private company is reaping all the benefits. This is simply not true. The Hospital Foundation received $75,000 from Symphony of Lights last year. That makes it the single largest community event that helps the people providing compassionate care for our family, friends, and neighbors every single day. I want to put that revenue in context. Maryland has a hospital financing system that is unique in the nation. Our revenues are defined at the beginning of our fiscal year by a rate-setting commission that we are allowed to, and, and what we are allowed to bill for our services is capped by the state and federal government. So we know at the beginning of the fiscal year how much we're going to get paid for whoever shows up at our hospital. The funds raised by the foundation give us the resources we need to serve this community in the way we know is necessary, like building new services like our new emergency department, investing in new services like our new breast cancer program and our heart attack victim program. We're doing elective semis and stents here now. It also enables us to provide underserved and under-resourced populations with needed care like the free COVID test we are currently providing to our faith-based organizations with a less than 24-hour turnaround time. These are how these funds are used. We have tasked the foundation with raising money for our latest construction project, and that effort is still ongoing. Additionally, the hospital foundation raises money for areas of our greatest need, and as probably with you, it's our unrestricted fund. This year's target for that fund is $285,000, and we have budgeted to receive these funds. So if this event fails to occur, we will actually be in a hole. Removing Symphony of Lights as a way to raise money for our needs, as this legal action threatens, would be a crippling blow that eliminates a quarter of that revenue in the midst of a pandemic as, as staffing costs are skyrocketing with COVID, but no more revenue is coming in. Here's an, another clarification that I want to offer regarding Symphony of Lights as a walking event <clears throat> instead of a drive through event. I acknowledge, and Milton and I have talked about the Columbia Association Board and the Inner Arbor Trust preferring a walkthrough light festival. Our staff has thoroughly over the years evaluated this option 
and unfortunately, it just doesn't work. Parking and walking long distances in frigid weather make it too uncomfortable and complicated. Other factors such as reduced visitor volume, logistics costs, signage, and other expenses would mean that Symphony of Lights would return no profit at all. Plus, it would mean that those, that those in our community with mobility challenges who simply can't walk a route of more than a mile in winter weather, or perhaps, perhaps our frail elderly friends and relatives can't participate. It would be a tragedy to establish events that only serve the needs of a few. I have never promised that, th that this would be a walkthrough event after 2019, because I knew that would not work. I only said that we would not be managing it here at the hospital. The debate in this legal action is unfolding during an unprecedented pandemic that is not about to end. The staff at Howard County General Hospital have cared for hundreds of COVID patients since March and are working tirelessly for our community. Our employees and our community need something to look forward to. In the winter months, when flu cases will surge, along with the expected rise in COVID, a family in a car will be able to safely drive through Symphony of Light, effectively in their own personal protective space. Symphony of Light might be one of the only events that takes place this holiday season, given the need to limit large group gatherings. Our citizens will experience the joy of the holiday season and they will be helping the caregivers who will be there if they, their children, their parents, or their grandparents get sick. Let's not jeopardize the most beloved event of the season. Symphony of Light should continue as a drive through event. It benefits our caregivers who are our healthcare heroes on the front lines every day, covert or not, servicing our community. And we really love to see a return to the cooperative relationship that we have all enjoyed for decades. Thank, Thank you very, very much, Mr. Chairman, and I'll be happy to answer any questions sure. you might have. Okay, uh, Janet first and then Jess. And Nancy. Okay, Janet. Yeah. Um, be Andy, before, before people start asking questions, and then. there's a mist of a lawsuit here. I'm wondering about the propriety of us saying anything. Well, this is ask any, asking any questions of Steve. Remember, the focus here is just any clarification you want from what Steve said. This right, is and not, we're not a party for this lawsuit. Lawsuit. Right, it's not supposed to be for the board to express opinions or things like this. This is, you know, if you have just anything that you'd like Steve to clarify. Mm -hmm. Janet. Yes, yeah, so you said that the hospital received $75,000 last year. I was wondering how that compared to what the hospital has received in previous years. It, it varies between a, a third and a half. We've had a lot of variability over the years dependent upon the weather. Can you give me some parameters of what a third and a half would equal? Oh, there, there have been times that we've made, in my tenure here, uh, $200,000. And there's been times that we've made less than that. And was the seventy-five thousand a uh, rental, or that was? That was a portion of the proceeds. And did you have a contract? It was. It was a one. Basically, as a one deal event, as you recall from what I said previously, we'd actually tried to put this out to bid, and the Inner Arbor Trust, as well as the uh, the organization that managed it last year and has managed it all these years, uh, we we ended up pulling the bids because because one was non-responsive and the, and the other couldn't fulfill the obligation as one of their partners pulled out for that year. Can you explain to me what unresponsive means in that context? Yes, there were certain parameters that we put in the request for proposal that the Inner Arbor Trust uh, did not offer to meet. Uh, Jess? Any, anything, Jess? Sorry, I had to unmute. Um, my question is whether the hospital has considered any alternate locations for holding Symphony of Life, um, HCC, you know, any other location in or around the Columbia area that might be a more suitable place now that there's construction in downtown Columbia. Great, great question. And, and absolutely we have. We've looked at many, many sites, both near in Columbia and, and literally almost out near Route 70. And unfortunately, none of them were able to materialize. And, and we looked at them literally over a two-year period. 
is, answer, could, no. could, yes. hang on, I'm, yeah. I just had one follow-up question to that. Um, can you give me a little bit of insight as to why they did not materialize? Or, I mean, I know obviously each one may be a specific situation, but what makes the Symphony Woods the desired location and makes that workable versus other locations? Simply because it has pavement to be drived upon. We, as if you recall earlier, I mentioned that we only believe that this can be financially successful as a, if it's a drive-through event. So we looked mm -hmm. at golf courses, we looked at parks, we looked at um, uh, vacant land, not vacant land, uh, farmland out in the western part of the community that, that uh, currently doesn't have any pavement, but the owner said that they, you know, be, we'd be willing to look at pavement, but the cost of pavement just proved to be prohibitive. Um, so it, it's a really unique um, I, I mean, where we're currently doing the, right now with Mario Weather Post is just a very unique setting, and Howard Hughes has been very accommodating to try and, you know, figure out ways to make this work. As, as you may know and recall from your experiences, we, we annually seem to have to jury-rig it around a little bit to uh, make sure that we can make it work. Okay, Nancy, thank you. Okay. Nancy and then Lynn and then Chari. Nancy? Uh, yeah, I think there's probably misinformation all, all over the place, um, which it would be great if we could get everything, all the facts correct. Um, I had heard that you were going to discontinue altogether in 2018 when this group decided that they were going to do it in 2019. Um, I, and I, um, my other question was, why would you be this past year getting so much less at 75,000 versus when you were getting more at 200,000. It seems like a, a marked difference. It, it is, but we did not have to put our own labor into it this time. You know, we, we had a lot of operating expenses ourselves, historically, all the marketing and all those types of things. So this all deferred to the, the manager who, who did it this past year. That, that's a, probably the most significant reason. And when, when you, so in 2018, when you said you were not going to do this anymore, you meant you weren't going to manage it, but you were aware that there were plans that it would go forth in the, from there into the right. future. Right. I, I, like I think what we recognize is that, that, that that location is somewhat in flux, constantly changing, yeah. and where there's a lot of development in areas that had not been developed pre previously, and, and we... Um, we just felt that given our other needs and, and other fundraising events in addition to this, we felt we needed to figure out how to wait to pay for the depreciation of the half a million dollar investment that we had made. And we, we also recognized that the trademark name, Symphony of Lights, was a very valuable commodity. And there might be others in the community who, and, and, and the other thing is, we certainly didn't want to take this event away from the community. As I mentioned, we looked for two years trying to find an alternative site. But we, we really, I mean, this is a cherished event. Nobody wants to take this away from the community. And, and so yeah. we just felt if there was somebody out there who could keep it going, it would be a benefit to the community. And I know the county executives have, and, and the business owners, frankly, in the community have, have, did not want to see it go away because it draws a, a lot of business for the restaurant downtown. Thank you. Uh, Lynn and then Shari. Then we're going to have to wrap Andy, it up. Could you add me to? Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, Steve, why did the hospital sign the temporary use permit in 2018 and in signing it agree not to have a driving event in the park again? It was not not to have the Symphony of Lights. The Symphony of Lights could certainly continue. But at, from 2016 to 2017 to 2018, it was clear that driving through Symphony Woods Park was not an appropriate use of the park. There are no roads. It's, there are dangerous, very dangerous passages through there. Um, it's a community park. And in 2018, you agreed that there would be no further driving events sponsored by the hospital. What changed? Yeah, I, I think there's some mis misinformation there. I, I didn't agree not 
to have a drive through event. I simply said Howard County General Hospital will be not be managing this event going forward. At the, at the time, we didn't even know what our final disposition was going to be because we didn't have the results of the bids back. So, Steve, you agreed that, did you agree to have that 2018 license transferred last year? That's the license that was used. I honestly, I, I'm, I'm not certain about that. I, you're, you're providing me information I'm not familiar with. I assume you've had Thank that before. I'm sorry. Sorry. Pardon me? Thank you. Um, Steve, I just had uh, two quick questions, and I do um, appreciate what you're saying about uh, the hospital being the community hospital, and in fact, it is the hospital for the county. Um, and Correct. so I think, um, particularly in terms of what you're going through with COVID right now, my question is really about the county. Um, have you talked to the county about using the county fairgrounds? We did. That was one of the sites we looked at, I guess, going back three years ago now, but it, it just didn't work out. We talked okay. to the county, and, and and there's a group of, I'm not sure what their name is, but there's a group that kind of maintains that for the county. It, it, my memory is not serving me uh, with, with the details of that, but we absolutely did look at that as an option, and frankly, another option that was across the street from there. Um, yeah, I have been to very large events there that have been very successfully managed, and since that is such a wide open area, um, and could certainly be done at cost, bringing in people from all over the county that would be very grateful for the services that you have provided during this very difficult time. Um, my other question was about your talks with Howard Hughes. Since Howard Hughes, um, in effect, took away the Crescent area, which had been the site, uh, my daughter used to volunteer for uh, Symphony of Light, so I know that area pretty well. Um, have they offered you any other way of driving through their property? Uh, not specifically to me, but I understand that the uh, event manager of, that uh, managed the past has been working with Howard Hughes, and they have um, figured out some options, whatever they are. I, I don't know. I don't know the specifics on those details. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Dick, thank, you, thank you for the work you do. Uh, yeah, I have a couple questions. Um, <clears throat> can you uh, get a percentage of the take, or do you have a, a fee that you get from IMA? I, I can tell you that last year was a one-off event because recall that the RFP, that stipulated exactly what the terms were that we were looking for. So, so last year was a one-off event, and, and I can get you, but I honestly don't know off the top of my head what that specific deal was last year. I just know that our proceeds were $75,000. Okay, and the uh, I can't, other I can't tell if it was a percent of, or a flat amount. Now, the other thing is, do you still own the lights and, and rent them out, or, or, or is we, did you sell them to IMA? Yes, we do own them. And, and we, have again, in, in the uh, RFP process, we asked for uh, somebody to either lease them or purchase them from us. Mm -hmm. So yes, today today we still own them, and that's and that's part of the challenge. We have a significant um, depreciated cost on our books for those lights. Okay, so you own the lights and you rent them to IMA, and is that you rent them for seventy five thousand dollars, or or is there more coming in above the rental? Fee? No, no, that. That was it. Seventy-five thousand. It was it. But I, I honestly don't know the details of whether that was a rent of them or whether that was simply the proceeds. But I'd be happy to get you the details of that information. In terms no, of I, I, I would be curious. Now, now, one final thing. Uh, we've been uh, kind of sketched out as being, uh, you know, Ebenezer Scrooge on this thing. Has anybody given you any reason why we would be doing this? Uh, has DAC or IMA told you what the uh, underlying problem is? No, well, Milton and I have talked literally for years, and, and I know it's concern, environmental concerns over driving over the property. 
Mm -hmm. What I understand was the not 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 easements, not paved property, but driving over grass like I think has occurred sometimes in prior years and and maybe the pollution associated with that. Okay, so so, okay, I'm not going to get into this, but um, yeah, I'm just trying to trying to understand whether you understand (laughs) what our situation is. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope we can resolve this. All right. Thank you very much. Andy, appreciate Jenny, you want last one? Yes, yes, thank you. Just, just a clarifying question, Steve. I heard you say that the lights cost five hundred thousand. Is that correct? They, they, uh, that was our reinvestment a couple of years ago. The lights have been around for twenty-five no, years, no. and right, right, but, right. I understand the five hundred thousand debt to the foundation, correct? Correct. That was an expense to the foundation. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Now, here's my question. Um, I don't know what you got the previous year, but you got 75,000 last year, according to your statement. So I guess, wouldn't that be going to paying off the debt that you had for uh, the lights that cost the 500,000? You know, it's an expense, yes. It could go to the, you know, it's, it's, it's a depreciation cost that we have, whether it goes to specifically a depreciation fund or whether it goes to programs, it's still an operating expense. So I, I guess what I'm what I'm trying to understand from you, you've incurred a significant debt of five hundred thousand. So far you've uh, earned or received seventy five thousand, maybe more, but you haven't said it. Um, it seems like all the goodwill and all the charity and all the help everybody um, there's no money to do that because you have to pay off the, the, the lights. And besides that, all the charity thing, I'm familiar with the Medicare waiver and how the system works with hospitals. That's what I did in the legislature. So I understand how you get paid for charity work, et cetera. It's taken care of in your rate setting. Pardon so I guess I, I guess I don't know where... Um, you still have quite a debt to collect from before you can start using that money for anything else. Well, that's that right. But we, that, that's what, that is correct. That's the way to say it because uh, we, we do have the expense on our books. And so having made that investment, that, that takes those funds that we invested away from programs that we might have developed for the community. But we thought it was a, it was a smart investment. And I just got a note from one of my staff members who must be listening to this, and she said that last year, um, with this one-year deal, it was a it was a fee and percentage of sale that resulted in the seventy-five thousand dollars. Okay, l- last question. You have contacted the county executive to uh, since this is a county event, really countywide. It benefits everybody all over the county and out, and it's regional event as well. It uh, brings people in from outside of the uh, county. Have you talked to them about it's time maybe they found you a site? Not specifically. I mean, we work with the county all the time, and, and I know that we've asked them if they felt there were any sites, and this is going back a couple of years ago, but we did not specifically request or demand that they find us a site. They, they've known can, can, candidly that it's, it's our event, and I don't think that they felt it was their responsibility to do that work. But but uh, you think it's the, uh, the CA board's responsibility to do the work? No, no, I'm not asking you to find an alternative site. What I, what I would like you to do is, is to allow us to continue to provide it like we did last year. That, that's what I'm saying. You find it's our responsibility to find a site, but you don't think it's the county executive's responsibility to try and find a site. For something that's countywide. Okay, thank you. No, I understand. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate your calling in. Andy, thank you. And and again, um, I know this is a, a difficult situation, but I I do appreciate your consideration, and be happy to talk to you again if if you should, should so desire. Yes, thank you, Steve. All right, take care. All right, consent agenda. Was approved, so we've approved the Kings Contrivance Committee Association representative. We've approved the uh, ad hoc committee working group, where we approved uh, live streaming of CA board sessions, work sessions. All right, we're going to go down now to board votes. First, we'll do the budget schedule for fiscal year 2022. 20, 
and then we'll do the minutes. Okay, so first up, is there a motion to approve the budget schedule for fiscal year 2022? Andy, I have a question. Sure, yep. Um, in looking over the schedule, um, it looks like the uh, we have a work session on September 10th. Um, the advisory committees um, will be getting their information. They have a deadline of September 20th to get their information in on the budget recommendations. And then September 24th, the board votes on parameters. That's not a whole lot of time between the advisory committees getting their information in September 20th and the board voting September 24th. In particular, the information will be going to, to Susan and her crew. Um, what provision is there to get that information to the board? We've never worked with such a condensed time. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to, to talk about that. So I think that um, it's it, it, this the September 10 description wasn't very clear. So what that is is for for the board to discuss and review what the total amount, you know, the parameter for the capital budget and the parameter, the limit for the <clears throat> um, operating budget. So typically you've done that in July um, and made and voted on that in July and then the uh, information, the requests come in from all um, the stakeholders into September and we pull them together and distribute them um, generally in October and that's still the case. It's a little bit later in October. So I just didn't, I didn't um, describe it very clearly in that September 10, but at that point, you know, you'd be setting the targets, the, the, the bottom line and the total capital spending, which typically you would do in July um, before you had any idea what anybody wanted, and then um, we would go through those projects. So, um, yeah, right. I, I do. I do understand that. Um, but because of the different situation this year, uh, we're not doing a continuation of a second year budget. Correct. So, so that really changes things. Um, and we usually have residents speak out with all of the villages. And anybody else who wants to talk about budget, having an opportunity to participate. Right. Um, and again, um, we, we don't really have a setup for doing that effectively right now. So that's so, in October. Excuse me. Yeah. So, so the the schedule. Uh, so typically, even this, we're treating this like a first year budget. So this, forget the second year because F the FY22 conditional budget, you know, in from February is doesn't make any sense anymore. So this is a first year schedule. It's just a little bit uh, later for the parameters. Instead of deciding in July, which you've done for, for years for the first year process, what the annual charge rate and cap would be, what the total capital dollars would be, what the um, target would be for an increase in net assets. We, we suggested, we proposed moving that to September so we would have some time to look at the actual results for, for FY21. Then it's just the same, we just started the solicitation process to get the community's input going. Um, you would have the same uh, amount of time to review those projects. You get the, you get the list of, you know, the, all the detail on the projects on October 23rd. On October 29, there would be a meeting that with an open public process to talk about them. Then again, on November 12th, an open public process. And then you would kind of do, uh, vote on the projects at that point. So it's, it's um, a very similar pro process. It's just um, the votes in November instead of October. The parameters are uh, September instead of July, but it's... Um, Still, still giving uh, the community the same amount of time to, to talk about these things. Okay, and um, and when you receive the information from the advisory committees, will you be sending that directly to the board? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
All right, and, thank you. And, and if I no. may, I think no. there's, a point of, there's a point of clarification, Shari, that the advisory committee's deadline is the same as everyone else. It's not the 20th of September, it's the 10th of September. Right. Yeah. Okay. So is there a motion to approve the budget schedule? Move. Okay, Nancy moved. Is there a second? Second. I'll we'll second it. Wait a minute, Janet seconded it. Janet was first. Yep, Janet was first. All right. Any other discussion? If not, is there any objection? Hearing none, assume it's approved unanimously. Thanks. All right, minutes. So there were two comments. Um, Shari, you had a change you wanted to make on lines uh, 160, 166, 167, I think. 165. Shari, uh, you're on mute. Sorry, I lost you for a moment. Um, yeah, let me just bring this up um, so that I can read it properly. I'm going to share it, Jerry. Yeah, can you can you read it? I'll, do, I'll pull it up. Okay. Can you see it? Mm. Okay. Um, I think it's 167. Uh, equal Ms. number. Suggested, yeah, Ms. Zarrett suggested creating a work group composed of an equal number. Um, that was not where I addressed the situation about the communications working group. It appeared later. So can we please um, omit that line? 167, right. 168. Let's just take that line out. Thank you. Okay, Jenny. Yeah. You had a question. Uh, uh, yes. Real quick on uh, page three, lines one twelve and one thirteen, and then down one thirty two and one thirty three. Um, I just want to make sure that there's clarification here. My understanding of what we did, because I had a friendly amendment to Dick's uh, amendment. Uh, his motion on 112 and 113 that basically in my I thought was limiting uh, the area to be covered by e-scooters to downtown and gateway so I think the reason at least I didn't second Janet's motion on 132 uh, 132 133 to adopt language that would limit e-scooters to downtown and gateway because I felt we already did it so I hope there's I hope I'm correct Okay, yeah, that's what the minutes caught. Okay. No, I made the motion and Dick cut me off, so. Right, and nobody seconded. Okay, okay. All right, <clears throat> so I'm gonna take the vote. Um, with that one change we did, um, are there any objections to approving the minutes um, for June 25th with the removal of that one sentence? All right, if not, assume that the vote is unanimous. Thank you. All right, um, board discussion, state legislation, there was none. So we're going on to uh, CAIT and virtual meetings. Um, so Milton, do you want to say anything first? Milton, okay. I think Yes, I'm, I, I'm off mute now. Yes, first, basically, I, uh, Chuck is out there, and uh, also we sent a memo to the board. And so what i like for Chuck to do is just first give the board an overview and also be prepared to address any questions related to the memo and how, how our systems, are, while our systems are set up, the total package when it comes to uh, what we're doing right now. Thanks, Milton. Chuck? Yeah, certainly. So I think the big point to clarify is the, the fact about the streaming. So 
I, I don't necessarily think that I was was really clear in a couple of these things. What we did is essentially took Google Meet and we used the output from this. So what you're seeing right now, instead of a camera just receiving that information and pushing it out to the solution that we already had in place in the boardroom, we just added this stream into that. So if, if you look at the, the CA website, there is a link, columbiaassociation.org, front slash live stream, where you will actually see the output from this. I just verified that it's up on on my phone. So the, the live streaming does exist. Another reason that we chose to go down that path is because it was already set up to record the meetings. So what we were looking at was the fact that we're, we're, we're using Google across the board for everything that we do for collaboration. Everything was built in place with the security for our domain that we could take advantage of that. The only thing that we've really done here is just simply introduce this information into that stream that's going out to the public. So in, in outside of that, essentially what you're seeing is Google Meet allows everybody to see one another, another if they participate. Uh, as we saw earlier with the resident speak out, that was an out of band solution that we put together. So it gives people the ability to be part of the stream and see that information come back, but they don't need to be an active participant in the, the Google Meet itself, where I'm sorry, that they actually have to share links to be able to watch that. They can continue to watch these meetings via the live stream link that we have on the, on the uh, CA website. So I think that was the big point that I took away from this. And again, if, if, a, if that's an oversimplification, I'm more than happy um, you know, to address specific questions that you have. All right. Let's see, Alan. I'd like to get in the queue. Yeah. I appreciate that, Chuck, but it doesn't speak to my concern. My concern is about sharing the link. And I don't see any problem with sharing the link. People, we can, we have people who share our boardroom all the time. Absolutely. And, uh, and they come in, and I don't see any reason why we can't share this link. Uh, we can ask people to turn off their cameras. We can require people to be turn off their mics so they're quiet. Uh, and I, I, not, I read what you wrote, and I, it didn't convince me that that wasn't an okay thing to do. Well, again, uh, Alan, I apologize that what we were attempting to do is keep a, a shareable link that is on the website and would be there if we changed the platform further down the road. So again, if we look at something else as an alternative solution with something that we have internally, we can still point it to the CA website and the streaming works as, as advertised. So I'm not talking about streaming, Chuck. I'm talking about people being able to be here and raise their hand at, at at uh, resident. resident speak out and said, like, I would like to speak and they, they could actually be, I don't see a downside to that. Uh, again, that's, that's an organizational decision. That's not, you know, that's not my decision to make. I mean, the, the functionality okay. there that you can, you can share that information. Now, the things that I Thank you. point out is that becomes an issue in terms of how do you manage uh, such a large group of people in terms of being able to, to, to see what's going on. But again, that, that's organizationally deciding, you know, if, if you want to share those links. There's, you know, there's the concerns about what the, what the organization is sharing and how would you manage keeping people on task? Would you kick people off? What's the protocol look like yeah. to kick somebody off those things? As opposed to if you have limited interaction and what would be, what we're seeing today, it's being streamed out to anybody that would want to, to, to watch that. Uh, in, in, in I appreciate that, Chuck. It's just that we were told, at least my recollection, we were told we couldn't do that uh, technically, and then we needed, kept needing to go through you, and it kept not happening and not happening and not happening. So it sounds like, from your point of view, technically it can happen. It's an organizational yeah. decision. I appreciate hearing that. The Thank issue you. you have with sharing a link in terms of what you have with me mm -hmm. is the number of people that you have available to it. I mean, it can be up to 100. Right now it's 250 people, but come the end of September, it will fall back to 100 based on the licensing we have. Again, having the pieces in place where we're live streaming out over the website, it doesn't matter how many people are viewing that. We can continue to support large numbers of people via, via that way. But no, there's, I mean, again, 
the the issue comes down to is is sharing that link something that the organization wants to do i mean there's it that it's right. not a technical issue thank you renee i think renee was next yes um i would like to know if it's possible that we could also add the audit committee open sessions to this uh proposal since this is an unusual time uh, that's not a question for me. I mean, again, a meeting. Yeah. So again, we will stream the board meetings just like we're we're doing. We will stream the work sessions and other any meetings the same way that we're doing this. The functionality, the solution doesn't change at all. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But may Char I follow up with that? Jess, Jess and then Charlie. Jess and then Charlie. My, my follow-up to that was, as I recall, and not being an expert, the audit committee sometimes goes into a closed session and then reopens. Is that correct? That I feel like could be tougher to manage if you're streaming. How do you close the meeting and and sort of kick everyone out so you can have that closed session and then re reopen it? That's technically I don't know how feasible that is, and I don't know if you could answer that question, Chuck. So streaming is is actually it's actually easier to do it that way because all we do is either through Drew or Sam we just stop streaming. We actually somebody is sitting. Oh in terms of production okay. what we're doing right now so it would be as simple as somebody saying stop streaming once we've completed once you've completed your work re-engage the stream and away you go okay okay great well thank you that answers my question meeting trying to manage who how you're kicking people out letting people back in those types of things you you would have more okay. challenge in terms of the actual meat management in that essence okay. sorry thank you yeah thank you um, Chuck, I had a question about um, the, the section of the memo where you talk about restrictions. Um, it says external participants can join directly only if they're on the calendar invite. Right. So that's when something goes out to that individual. You'll see, I don't, I don't know if anybody saw it, but when somebody was coming in earlier while the meeting was starting up, if somebody wasn't if somebody was using an address that wasn't on the invitation, you would see it pop up as saying, so-and-so is trying to join this meeting. Will somebody let them in? So that's where the difference is. A direct, in, an, a direct invitee can come directly into the meeting. If it's, if it's a shared link and it's somebody is actually using another email address or another phone number to come in, then you'll, you'll see prompts for those types of things to join the meeting. The other thing is, is if somebody's just using voice, you're going to have issues with identification in terms of the meat itself and trying to understand who somebody is because essentially what you'll see is the the telephone icon like like there are on the screens right now that you know that you, you might not necessarily know who that is simply because it's a blind number uh shari shari you're, you're muted shari okay sorry Okay, so so just to follow up on that to make sure I understand. Um, so the thing that is most parallel to what we have been doing with Resident Speak Out is that people could sign up for regular uh, for Resident Speak Out a week in advance. Once the agenda goes up, they could be added to a list. And then they could, in effect, be admitted to the meeting, just like we do, where we take down a name, we take down an address, um, we ask them what village they're from. Um, that would be a parallel process, correct? Certainly. Okay. Um, the other thing, it says that... Uh, with external participants, you can't join the meeting more than 15 minutes in advance? That's correct. That is a limitation set by Google. Okay, so that's within that's within Google. All mm -hmm. right. And I guess my third question is, if the board wanted to do a kind of town hall or a kind of larger conferencing, I just participated in a large conference run by Johns Hopkins University multiple panels people were able to call in and ask questions from really all over the country all over the world um if we used some other kind of platform like zoom 
which um, a lot of people are comfortable with, and it was recorded, could that Zoom recording be hooked into the CA system? I, I can't speak to that, Shari, because again, we're, we're using Google Meet today. We haven't, we haven't done that. So again, that would be something that would require us to look into in terms of how we would layer that on to what we're doing today. What do we, we have any kind of, yeah, do we have an exclusionary uh, uh, license with Google? With, uh, Google? Is sorry? there anything? Is there anything in our license agreement with Google that would prohibit us from doing anything else? Uh, I, I'm not specifically understanding that, but your limitations are going to be based on the number of people that you can have in a meeting room. As I said earlier, the the platform, the license tier that we're on right now, will allow 250 con concurrent connections to a meet. At the end of September. Google has said that this tier will go back to 100. Given where we are with the current lay of the land, I don't necessarily know that that'll hold true. Okay. So you're you. talking about a recording, though, aren't you? You're talking about can, could we post a recording of a meeting? Yes. Or are you talking right. about the, yeah? Absolutely. Okay. That's, thank that's, you. That's a file at that point. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other questions for Chuck? Yes, I do. Alan. I just want. I just want to. It's not so much a question for Chuck as a response to Shari that, yes, it would emulate most of residents speak up, but it wouldn't emulate the person who at the last minute, having heard something, wants to raise their hand and say, yes, I do want to speak, uh, if they have to sign in uh, days before, if they have to sign up for residents speak out days before. Chuck, I think our current process um, you can sign up to the day before, right? You know, Andy, I, I believe, I think we have it set at, at either 48 or 72 hours right now. I can confirm that with the with yeah. staff. But, uh, right. you know, again, it's, it's an out of band solution. So we can set the times to that, to, to whatever. Right. We... Oh. Yeah. It's just, um, enough yeah, time we can contact people that's to let them know. Developed internally. Yeah. Because I think we're doing it now, um, up to a day before. I, I believe that's true. Is it, Nancy? Is it possible to do it on the day of or right before? Why do we have to put a time limit on it? Uh, sure. I mean, again, we can, we can set it to, to, to whatever you want to use. Again, all this does is it's a form that's collecting the information from the individual that wants to sign up. That's That's all it is. I mean, there's... There's, there's no great mystery to it. And as you can see, Drew is the one making the phone calls. So if we have the information collected, then, you know, we can, we can work around that. Andy, will this be coming up for a board vote? Cause this is scheduled here for this board discussion. Yeah, we can, I mean, we can put it on our next meeting. Please do. What? Yeah. No. Andy, I want to make sure that the board, board understands what it asks asking for because the board is all over the place when it comes to what he's asking and what Alan is asking for is entirely different than what Shari, what Shari has been talking about. Right. Well, we'll have to definitely come up with. We'll take a vote and we'll come right. up with a board decision. Right. Right. Again, Any other questions? anything based on parameters that, that you give us, I mean, well, the, Again, we're using solutions that have that have been tested. They're tried and true. Um, you know, it, it's it's just a matter of wrapping the, the workflow and the process around it. Well, Chuck. Also, I want to make sure, as you know better than I do, I to me the primary thing is protecting our system. Certainly, absolutely. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, Chuck. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting. <laughs> all right, Chairman's remarks. It was all submitted in writing. Any questions? All right, President's report. Any questions for Milton? I do. Alan? Yeah, whether it's from you, Milton, or from uh, Dan or whoever, I'd like to hear a response to the uh, gym question we heard earlier. Mm. Well, 
well, first, I wanted to know if Dan is out there. If Dan is not out there, then I will I will give you my insights. I'm here. Um, it's a very complicated issue, as you can tell. Um, uh, everybody has an opinion um, and a perspective. Um, and it is something we literally talk about every day. Um, not just internally, but I talk to people all across the country um, about it, and everyone's in a myriad of different situations. Um, some jurisdictions require masks full time. Um, other jurisdictions, like Maryland, um, uh, you know, we're following the Maryland guidance um, that, that the governor issued, um, and that is the vast majority of the states. Um, but it is it is a constant conversation. Um, uh, there, a couple couple um, points um, because again the conversation and this this information was sent to all the governors of all fifty states. Um, uh, there was a study done in Oslo, Norway, um, by a university um, with participants using a fitness facilities. They took um, 4,000 people, 2,000 in each group, just under 2,000 in each group, 1,980 some and change, um, and uh, had asked half to use a fitness club for two weeks without masks and half to use or not to use the club. Of the half that used the club, 82% um, used it at least once, 33% used it at least six times. Um, in all of the subjects, there was only one reported case of coronavirus. Um, and through contact tracing, that was found to be contacted at work. Um, the reference to the West Virginia uh, incident, um, that, that headline could have been written about virtually any business. Somebody who tested positive went to the club, um, and so they notified people. Um, that was the last anybody wrote of the story. And why was that? Because nothing happened. There was no spread. There was no mass outbreak. Um, it was just the headline that grabbed the attention at the moment. There was no follow-up. Um, URSA done, has done a national study of over 165 clubs that opened. Um, and with over three and a half million visits, the number of reported cases um, from both staff and members was 0.004%. Even in Arkansas, where there was a major uh, up spike, um, contact tracing only traced 0.3% of those people visiting a club. So, while there are instances, there is not a mass, clubs are not a mass point of outbreak for coronavirus. There is no data that says that is the case. That doesn't mean we should not be careful and we shouldn't be doing everything we can, um, which is why we took, take the steps of um, wearing masks, except for when you're actually working out, which is the guidance from the state um, which is why we have the spray bottle, which is why we made the investment in the UV filters, uh, the fan. We have the social distancing, the equipment blocked off, um, all of the protocols that are in place to make sure we're as safe as possible. But again, that doesn't mean we don't have this conversation every day. So as a matter of fact, I have marketing preparing a messaging packaging that if we decide to go all mask all the time, the package will be ready to roll out because it is a constant conversation and things are always changing as we evaluate the situation. Right now, I, the situation- Could I just say, could I just say Dan, I, I appreciate what you're saying and I don't think you can say we're being as safe as we can because we could do other things. We're being as safe as Maryland law allows us requires us to be. You're right. 
Okay. I'd like to get in here. All right. Yes. Nancy? Yeah. Um, I, I understand that we're doing what the state says, but we have customers or, or members who depend on us to look out, especially during these rather stressful times, for um, for their well-being. And I, I mean, you can't go into a store without wearing a mask. I think people are learning that, um, and I think it's become very customary for people to wear their masks. I would hope that we wouldn't make it a suggestion or um, something for people to consider. I would like to see CA become a whole lot more um, militant, I guess, about having people wear their masks. Um, sure. If I don't know why they can't wear them while they're working out. I don't know, as just as um, Kurt said earlier, I don't think anybody is doing anything so stressful that they cannot wear which some are for example but they could wear something and I think if nothing else it's for people's mental well-being as well to feel that they're safe that um, I've seen the spray and I appreciate that but I still think people will feel safer if they are surrounded by people with masks as opposed to people without masks I would not go into a gym if they didn't have their masks on so, Can I jump in, uh, Andy? Sorry. Right. Um, you are correct for a segment of the population. Um, uh, again, there's a spectrum of what, what people want and what people are comfortable with. Um, my staff has actually tested working out with a mask, and it is not pleasant. Um, uh, one of the biggest causes of problems with COVID-19 is comorbidity. And so we need to encourage people to work out. We need people to encourage to stay fit and healthy because it is the comorbidity that causes all of the issues. Every place that requires masks full time, and again, like I said, we're, we're making preparations if that happens, if we make that decision or somebody makes it for us, um, but usage has dropped up to 40% people stop coming because you, it is not comfortable to work out in a mask. Um, some of the, some of the, the free weight areas, they could, um, the cardio equipment, no, the usage drops up to 40%. I have, I have um, peers in Louisiana and Colorado and Nashville where they're requiring masks full time. Um, their usage has dropped. What they also have an increase in is all of a sudden, everybody has a medical issue because they don't have to wear a mask. So they're not wearing them at all um, because they're coming up with medical issues. And some, some places aren't verifying that. Um, and so it becomes a, a different issue. So we're pushing the issue around. There are, there's always gonna be issues and challenges. And what we're trying to do is walk that line where we can have an opportunity to keep people safe, but also get people to work out and be fit because that is one of the positive factors in the severity of any kind of COVID illness. Okay, Dick um, and then Andy. No, okay, uh, uh, we yeah, using I, the chat box. Whoa, 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 whoa! Yeah, using yeah. the chat box. I was in line, and then Ginny, and then Dick. Oh, so if sorry. you don't mind, no, okay. no problem. Um, yeah, I, I'm obeying. I'd with like the chat to do box. that way. <laughs> sure. All right, Jess, Ginny, and Dick. And I've been trying to keep track of who says they want in and add them that way. So my my question is um, sort of quick, and it has to do with the fact of um, staff. I know there have been issues with if we go to an all mask all the time policy who's responsible for enforcing that and you know if we have our frontline workers at the gym having to tell people hey you can't come in without a mask and then that customer is angry and combative you know what what 
what could potentially happen there. I'm not saying we shouldn't do it. I just think that's something that we have to consider. I would personally feel safer if they were ma mandatory, but I think we need to consider then how that's enforced and who's responsible for that. Is the gym manager going to have to beat the door all the time? Are we going to have to hire a bouncer that stands by the door and tells people you can't come in without a mask? I mean, I know it's been a problem at local retail establishments. I don't know if you guys saw that whole conversation about the CVS and Wild Lake not importing masks and people being upset and da 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 da, da. So, so that's just something that I think we need to consider. So I appreciate what Dan is saying about trying to straddle that line. And it sounds like from what the gentleman who spoke said that to a certain degree, the customers are trying to self-enforce with their peers and remind them. It's just tricky all around, like Dan said, because everybody has a different comfort level. So I'm um, just something we need to consider as to how that would be enforced and then so sorry then jenny then dick jenny <laughs> okay thank you thanks jess okay thanks jess um i i think i would like to encourage board members that have not used the clubs to please do that uh then you'll have a better idea if you don't already of what is that happening a couple of quick issues in aquatics you're not going to wear a mask in the water i don't think swimming or uh, you know i mean it's just not going to happen however when you walk into a club they are doing a phenomenal job staff is you must have the mask on they tell you that um you're just not going to get into that club without a mask on then they hand you a bottle a spray bottle and a towel my only suggestion, Dan, that you might want to look at is there'd be something there where as you walk into the club, you can clean your hands, sanitize your hands right away. It got, it hurt, suggested that. Mm -hmm. I, I think that may have potential. But you get this bottle and you get... I'll check. What? There's supposed to be hand sanitizer at the entryways. I'll, I'll double check. No, uh, but they give you... I mean, they're just great about giving you the bottle and the towel, okay? And they say, do you know how to use it? I mean, these, these guys are absolutely phenomenal in it the athletic club and the supreme sports club where i've gone um so staff deserve a lot of credit um i noticed also um when you're on a treadmill say they have social distancing so that's already established the, again the staff's done an outstanding job of saying what you where you can be what you can do which what direction you must go in. take a look at this guys they really have spent a lot of time doing this so that you feel, I think, feel safe going in there. Um, I think you're going to lose people if you insist that they have a mask all the time. Uh, because by doing a treadmill with a mask on or a bicycle, if you're going a certain speed, is not very comfortable. But, you you know, as I said, you've cleaned down your own treadmill. You, you're facing a window. You could take it off. However, you also have some personal responsibility. If somebody comes a couple of treadmills away and it's a young guy, I've, I've done this once, and he starts really moving, I just get off mine and go further down the aisle and start on a new treadmill and get you know, away from him because um, that is a concern that I have. But you might want to think about, although I don't <clears throat> see how you get this to work, is have uh, mask-only times at a club where those that feel everybody must wear a mask then you know you go a certain time of day I, I don't particularly like this idea but you go a certain time of day and you wear a mask the rest can go and use the same system you have now where people are actually saying to somebody else excuse me you don't have your mask on and that seems to work because people do forget once in a while you know they've been on a treadmill they've been on a bike uh, they forget to put it back on when they're walking around the floor which they're supposed to do and, and others just say, excuse me, and they go, oops, and put it back on. Uh, so I think your system is working extremely well. If you really feel you've got to implement mask-only times, I would not go to an extreme when everybody has to have a mask, um, my own personal opinion. I think you're going to lose customers that way. Dick? Well, first of all, I'd like to apologize for cutting in the line there. Uh, I hit chat and nothing happened. What am I doing wrong? Am I supposed to hit the caption thing too? Or what? what You're supposed what, to type at the bottom, send a message to Just start yeah, typing. Yeah, type at the bottom. Once you hit the chat, just type. 
Boy, that's easy. I apologize. I intended to do a little tutorial before tonight's meeting, and my day got away from me. So, uh, yeah, we'll we'll work on that before the next meeting. Well, this is hard <laughs> touch, you know, teaching us old dogs new tricks. Um, I thought you raised a couple of interesting questions uh, or issues there, Dan, and, and it sounds like the science is with you in terms of, uh, you know, what, what research has been done on, on fitness clubs. Um, just want to suggest that, you know, this is a real emotional issue for a lot of people. And uh, I think it really comes down to a marketing question. Are more people going to quit if they have to wear a mask? Are more people going to quit if they, they aren't forced to take a mask? And uh, I guess that's why you make the big bucks to try to figure that out. And I, I just will throw one word of caution in. And that is, I've seen companies go out of business when they when they make the wrong judgment I, I, i'll never forget bon vivant vichy swaz they had a bad batch and they're no longer selling soup anymore and we've seen what's happened happened with chipotle when they've had outbreaks so we uh, we really don't want to get in the news for being a center of infection so uh I, i'm going to leave it up to you it sounds like you're doing the right thing all right i guess i'm next um, what I, mean, I wanted to you're all getting a look into my every day. Yeah. <laughs> this is, I mean, this, all of this, this is a very touchy subject and there's a wide range of opinions. Uh, this is what my every day looks like. <laughs> um, Dan, I wanted to second Ginny, particularly at Supreme Sports Club. Um, you know, right at the door, they make sure you have your mask on. You can't get in without the mask. Um, they, they have signs, they announce, they go around making sure, remind people, keep your mask on if, unless you're actually exercising. Um, so I think that that's pretty good. Um, and I can verify the times I've gone to the gym that staff has been pretty good about making sure people remember, making sure that they have their masks on. Um, if they see somebody without, they'll, they'll remind them. Um, but in regard to exercising, you know, there's lots of different types of exercises. It's like Jenny said, you are not going to wear a mask in the aquatics class. You're probably not going to wear a mask in the cycle class because it gets really, really tough. Um, and the same thing in some of our other classes like body pump, which are very strenuous. Um, so, yeah, maybe if you're lifting free weights, as Kurt said, you could do it with a mask. But if you're doing serious bike work, or some of the other classes, having a mask is just not going to work. Um, those classes, in essence, we might as well cancel them because it's, 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 it's almost impossible to ride a bike with a mask on, um, particularly if you're more than a certain age. <laughs> um, but that's what I want to say. I wanted to say, in particular, thanks to the Supreme staff because they do really um, kind of push the wear your mask and the regulations and this instructor is the same thing. Like once we get in a bike class, they'll say, you've got to keep your mask on unless you're riding the bike. And as soon as you get off the bike, then they say, put your mask on. Um, so they, they are taking precautions. So thanks, Dan. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Shari's next. And then Janet. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I think um, I'm glad to hear that you that you've got a plan B um, because um, I listened to the conference that Governor Hogan did and he was very uh, firm about um, those regulations can change very fast if our numbers continue to go up. So I think that's the most important thing to, to have a plan B, to have new signs prepared to be all ready to go. Um, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, to speak to Andy's point, um, the other thing that's possible is not every class that CA offers has to run. There are some things that may be more appropriate or less appropriate. I have certainly seen joggers going around the lakes when I'm outside, and there are those who are wearing masks and there are those who are not. So it's not impossible to do uh, a treadmill with a mask on. I think it's more uncomfortable to use a mask inside and do that kind of jogging than it is to do it outside. 
that's that's just um, I'm just reflecting that on my own experience. Um, the other thing I did want to ask about from the report that we got um, while we have you, Dan. Um, you said you had about 220 swimmers um, that were that were back. I've heard some very nice things about the swimming, but what I wanted to ask are all those 220 people clippers. How many of those are people um, who are just Colombians members who are using the indoor pool? Because you can't use the locker room, my understanding. You can't use the locker room and you can't use the um, the bathrooms. So you can use the bathrooms. You can't use showers oh, or okay. that, that's okay. part of the guidance as well. So you can't use bathroom or showers or locker rooms um, at any of the facilities. Um, uh, that, that 220 number is actually, it's a bigger number now. It keeps growing um, as we find more time and we get more efficient. That is all Clippers. That is not swimmers. That is all Clippers kids. Um, and that is uh, growing by leaps and bounds. Um, and we're one of the actually only one of the few teams that are actually uh, in the area that are still operating um, for various reasons, whether financial um, pools didn't open or in one case um, their pool broke and the facility's not gonna fix it. Um, so we are actually one of the few few swim teams that are, that are operating. Um, Okay, so, so great for teams, but what do we have for residents, families? Um, well, uh, we've, we've added, we have the rec swims at both Swim Center and Columbia Gym. Um, we have added swim lessons, which filled up as soon as we announced them. Um, we sent the email out and swim lessons filled up ASAP. Um, and I'm actually uh, working with, um, in conjunction with uh, community services, Michelle and her team. Um, I don't know if you guys were aware, one thing we used to do in the kids space was have um, kids space, kids night out, where parents would come drop their kids off on Friday night. Uh, we'd have a program for them, they'd go out for a couple hours. So we're working on trying to recreate that during the day um, and uh, be able to offer um, a uh, parents' night out and no, a parents' afternoon out. Um, and we're going to test. Uh, right now we're debating on whether to do it at the sports park or keep it indoors um, as the test site. Um, and then if that uh, proves to be popular and, and we're able to uh, do that in a safe and efficient manner, which we wouldn't do it if we didn't think we could, um, we'll replicate that. And now with schools being virtual, we'll probably carry that all the way through through the fall. I think that's a great idea. That's really creative thinking and stepping in and using our facilities in a different way. So thanks for coming up with that. That's a great idea. <laughs> you know, it was just, I was talking to uh, our Clara Bridge rep and uh, we were talking about the, the volume of the, the surveys was gonna go down because the outdoor pool was closed. Now he lives in Reston. But he was like, I can get that. I can get why people would not be happy because I need something to do with my kid. And then I was just like, you know, and I just kept thinking about it. And then the next morning I woke up and I'm like, kids day out, parents day out. Let's figure something out. Um, so yeah, we're looking at different options right now because Michelle and her team have the expertise in managing kids. I'm the adult guy. So I, I brought in Michelle to help us with the kids. Um, and make sure we're, we're doing everything we can to be as safe as we, we can be with them. Janet? Yeah, I actually just have the same question as Ginny. Would we consider having um, hours where people would be required to wear masks so that those who would like to um, could do that? We, we're, we've discussed it and we're looking at it. Um, you know, Obviously, if it wasn't at 5 a.m., um, we have a contingency that would back, but. <laughs> um, you know, there's, the only way that the 5 a.m. group is coming back is if we get the locker rooms back. Right. The locker rooms are what's really holding the 5 a.m. group back. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, know, to, oh, sorry, go ahead. We're, we're looking at it. Um, it just gets a little hard as you start blocking off different times, then you start pushing other people to other times. So then you 
start crowding the facilities at other times and you know so you got to be careful we're, you know we're trying to because right now the spread is relatively even because people aren't working mm -hmm. or not, or not, that's not the right word a lot of people are still working from home so they have more flexibility so we don't see our normal peaks and valleys um so we're trying to be cautious of not pushing too many people to one time frame um, you know, again, but it, it is a conversation we have all the time. We are exploring uh, what our possibilities are as we see how traffic continues to go. Thank you. Renee. Oh, nothing. Okay. Yeah, that was actually Alan nominating oh. Renee. But uh, let me just say, I, I, I heard your response. I'm not going to ask you to repeat it, but I, I do think the all math time, just as we've experimented with, I know we ended it, but uh, women only swim at the swim center and that sort of thing. So it may be something that would be useful. But I'll just, I don't know where Renee is, but I was just watching you, Renee, and I would love to just don't play poker. Um, but I was watching your face as others were talking, and I'd love to hear what was going on with you. But if you'd rather not share, that's fine with me. Um, nothing. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thanks, Renee. Um, any other questions for the president? Is we're on his report. <laughs> uh, yes, I'd like to ask one thing. Sure, Dick. Uh, yeah, Milton. Um, I'm really excited to see that we got somebody coming in to take care of the communications burden. Uh, it sounds like you've got a good, good, uh, good recruit there. Uh, it'd be good, good seeing the uh, communications department coming, getting back up to speed. Uh, I noticed you call him though uh, director of marketing. Uh, I think the title used to it used to be the marketing and communications and marketing department. Um, but what exactly is the title and, and uh, what what's the department title? The, part, the, the department title is the Department of Communications and Marketing. The the, uh, the department director is the chief marketing officer. Okay, uh, shouldn't that be the chief communications officer? No, we went, remember we, I, I made a reference in there, we did a top to bottom assessment of the mm -hmm. department several years back. And out of that came the, the recommendation that we switch from being a director of communications and marketing to a chief marketing officer, understanding that, as you know better than I do, Dick, you can't have marketing without communications and you cannot have communications without marketing but it's a marketing communications is still a significant component of that job but marketing is 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 we felt we could get a skill set more conducive and, and better fit for what we were doing in that department than just having a director of communications because we saw the difference in the skill sets and i know that from experience okay well i'm let me mull that over. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, I do. Alan? I want to, I want to follow up on, on that. I, I hear you, Milton, in terms of skill set. Seems to me you could get the same skill set by keeping the title as marketing and communication. No, I mean, Alan, we have experience. Remember when we went through this process, when I first came to Columbia Association, we didn't even have a department. I asked the board to reconstitute it. And the board at the time said, Milton, let's stay with the Department of Communications and Marketing and you can do whatever you want with the staff. And so that's when I had the top to bottom assessment and we came through because I know I can I know from experience, if I go out trying to hire a director of communications and marketing, I'm gonna get a different application a resume than I do when I go out to hire a chief marketing officer and I have seen that from experience in Reston and also since I've been here okay but my, my suggestion was to keep marketing first and communication second and you switched it in what you just said no Alan you were the one if I recall correctly the reason why I wanted to go to the Department of Marketing and Communications you you said less you recommended oh, I and I agree that we stay with the Department of Communications and Marketing because we want to make sure we're sending the message. It's not just trying to sell you something, but we're also communicating to you. Right, but I think we then subvert the message by hiring only a director of marketing. So 
Uh, my other question to you, uh, but I hear you, and I'm glad you were listening, and you're right. I was one who was promoting centering marketing, uh, centering communication uh, as versus marketing. You're absolutely correct. Um, do you have, have you had a seat on the hospital board? Me? You, you asked? No, you. I, I've you. Ne- no, I've never been on the hospital board. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, Nancy. She's on the chat. Nancy? Yes. Um, I understand about the marketing and the communications and getting two different animals. Also, think that we have just experienced, uh, uh, and I know Paul has had his hands full, but uh, I think that the one thing, if nothing else, that I've learned is that the communications have really been quite bad over the past few months when we have needed good communications more than ever before. And so I, I suspect that that could be what Alan and um, Dick might have been um, questioning about. I don't want to speak for them, but I, I do know that that is my concern about this, that though we have a new marketing director, I would like to know who is going to handle the communications and how they're going to be handled so that going forward, can we trust that our community is going to be hearing from CA in every conceivable way and given good information? This is my concern. Well, Nancy, if you read my email that I sent the other, just the other day, I, I mentioned in there we're, ha- we're down to two finalists for the communication for a senior media, media relations manager position, the position that David Greisman used to have. So mm-hmm. I believe that within the next, well, we should, we should have, a, I'm hoping to have a final to make an offer by Monday, but definitely within the next couple of weeks, we should at least have a person committed to, to that position. Okay. It was un- it was unexpected that when I had basically within a short window I lost I lost the director of the department and also someone David that I relied on ever since I've been here. That was a hit. Right. Yes. Right. Yeah, for all of us, I agree. <clears throat> Jenny. Jenny, you're on mute. Jenny? Try control D. Sorry, that thing wasn't coming up to allow me to do it. Okay. Um, what what I understand, Milton, or I think I understand, and just see if this is correct, and I'll be real brief about it. We're going to have somebody that handles communications, which is overall throughout CA, um, where we have a director of uh, communications and marketing. It's really marketing department. So if there's an issue, uh, it seems to me that we should be getting assistance from the department that's actually involved in that issue, like open space, if that's the issue, Uh, sports and fitness, if there's an issue there, marketing, if there's an issue there. And this communication person, the chief of communications, a separate person, would be actually hopefully assisting you and assisting the board in coming up with a way to try and explain to the residents what was happening in open space or whatever, uh, in sports and fitness or in marketing. Okay. They would help coordinate it. Jenny, and that's, I, been, I, that's been lacking uh, in, in the agency since David left, although he really didn't do too much of that for us. Well, Jenny, as I just responded to Nancy, we're in the mm-hmm. process of hiring a, a person, a senior media relation uh, a, a manager that will help us with the communications. Well, okay, what I'm trying to understand, the person, yeah, that's that's like the David replacement, right? Yes. That's what I just said. I like that approach is what I'm trying to say, as opposed to the marketing person actually, for some reason, is is responsible for communications as well. I don't see it. They should only be responsible for trying to assist in communications that deal with marketing issues. But Where, Jenny, we, we have a department, and we're trying to put it back together, and we'll get there. Yeah, okay. okay. All right, let's move on. Well, Andy, uh, I, I, I pushed chat and typed in my name, and nothing happened. So yeah, <laughs> I sorry, Nick, it, it didn't come up. 
Uh, okay, I'll, did you hear that? I'll, I'll try to learn this by the next meeting. Um, I just have one uh, one more comment. I think it would help us understand just how this uh, department is being set up if we could see the job descriptions and get a better idea of who's doing what. Uh, so if, if Milton could, uh, you know, share those with us, that would uh, probably solve this problem. Well, if I may, Dick, could I could I have the time to get the new direct the new direct lead of the department on and that person? I want that person to have an opportunity to come in and put together a department because I have my own ideas, but I would like for that person to have the input. Right now, we're working with him, and as I said, we're, we're dealing with some gaps in the in the department because we have lost a department director and a senior person mm -hmm. let us get back to that point and we will we will get there we but i just need to get i need to get the department back together okay i i just thought i'm just trying to picture how you're doing this uh, what, what's the timeline you think before we uh, have this well, all said, i once again i shared in the email yesterday that the, the the chief marketing officer the person you'll be starting on the 31st of august we will have. Uh, I hope to have a, 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 a make an offer to a to the senior media relations person who will be the me, uh, communications manager for the in the department. Uh, with I hope within the next week or two. Okay. When you um, publish for this job, uh, did you provide a job description? For for which job? Uh, for either of those jobs, uh, to the recruiter. It was, it was part of. Yes, it was. Could you share that with us just so we see where we're starting from? Yes, we can. I, I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Okay, let's move on. Um, we have a written report from Interarbor Trust. Any questions? Uh, I have uh, one question. Dick? Um, the, uh, the report said the pathway system's about to go in. Have we paid for that yet? Did that come out of another budget? Because I thought we'd... Uh, um, uh, shut down most of our capital spending. The, 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 uh, the, hold them on. The, the pathway system. Remember, uh, there's two pathways that are going in. There's mm -hmm. there's a there's a pathway that CA extended a, a grant, and um, I think that actually the grant was in fiscal year 2019 to the Ann Arbor Trust, and it oh, just. Okay. So we We've already paid for that then. Yes. Okay. That's all I need. And, and the second pathway is coming from, is being funded by the county government. Okay. Good. Okay. We're going to move on to the financial reports, um, the audited financial statements, and the fourth quarter financial report. Um, audit committee members. We had the audit committee meeting Monday. Dick, your vice chair, you want to say anything? <laughs> Well, we were mostly talking about something in a closed meeting and then an executive session. But uh, we, we did look at the numbers and uh, I nothing jumped out at me to, to, as a problem. Dick, you might want to mention that the auditors did report to the audit committee. Oh, oh yeah, that was what the closed part of it was. And yeah, yeah I, I don't know how I... I I'm kind of mixed up as to what part was which part, but yeah. And, right. we, got, we, and we got a clean bill of health on that. Yes, right. well, I think that's one point to emphasize. We got a clean opinion, and and um, basically, I know I'm biased, but we, we did an excellent job, especially given the circumstances we dealt with, basically in, in the um, the last two, I mean, last month and a half or two months of the of the quarter. Any questions? So it was a good session, and there were, I think, six board members present. Um, so, you know, a number of people got to hear um, the auditors and the financial report. Susan, is there anything you want to mention on financial report or anything? No? You're I muted, don't... Susan. Uh, yeah, no, I, I don't think there's anything to report. Um, if anybody has any questions, be happy to try to answer them. All right. Any questions now? 
tracking forms? Any questions on the tracking forms? Right. Let's go on to new topics. Did, 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 some, did somebody oh. add to the tracking form the response that the resident who spoke is owed today? No, that's a good idea. Who, who does yeah, that? Uh, so um, I have a note to respond to Ms. Danner. Uh, she has the two questions about the financials. So um, I'll, I'll follow up on that. And add it to the, do you add it to the tracking form or does somebody else add it to the tracking sure. form? Sure, I'll, I'll make sure it's added to the tracking form. Great, thank you. Andy? Yes. Uh, just one other thing. In the minutes, we mentioned that uh, the board had, sort of, uh, had, had formed a uh, subcommittee to uh, talk about communication strategy. Uh, we finished our report there. It was sent out the other day. And uh, we're looking forward to getting any feedback on that. Send the feedback to the committee. Right. And, and that's right. uh, Jess and Ginny and me. Okay. New topics. Nancy. Yeah. Um, um, someone, am I muted? You can hear me? Yes, we can hear you. And Janet is pulling up your request. Oh, oh, good. Well, I'll just tell you what it is without looking it back because I don't need that. The, uh, from line one who is diabetic. My guess is he's in his 40s. He does not qualify for the senior times and he would like to be able to um, do his workouts and so on, the necessary exercise that he does because of his illness. And he was very upset because he had asked about being allowed to do it um, during the senior times and he was told he cannot. And so it's not just him, but there are other members of the community that have other diseases, makes them more vulnerable to COVID, um, as the CDC has listed a number of them, people with heart disease and, and um, COPD or, or whatever they have. And these people, because they are more vulnerable, along with the aged, should also um, have the same privilege of being able to work out um with fewer people around so i'm hoping that we can see our way clear to providing a policy to treat them so that they can also benefit from the time when the jeans gyms or pools have lesser use all right any questions i have a question How do we go about um, this? yeah yeah, I guess that's kind of my question. How do we go about this? <laughs> so back when we originally reviewed this, uh, the recommendation, which I assume we accepted since we accepted the form, was that um, based on urgency, the board would decide whether this gets added to a future agenda, whether it gets added to the next agenda, or whether we uh, waive the three reading rule and add it immediately if we feel like it's urgent or time sensitive enough to do that. So the idea of this form is simply to agree to put it on an agenda. Um, the exception to that rule would be in the case of something being urgent. Um, if, the, if the board you know, has a majority um, that suggests that it's urgent enough to vote tonight, then th that is part of the possibility. Um, if we feel like we vote on it Next time, um, keep in mind that our next meeting is at the end of August. Yeah, and I think the timeliness is certainly an issue here. Yeah. Sherry, you're muted. Um, I put myself I, in I the would, chat. Hmm. I would like to suggest I got that, since, that, that since our next meeting isn't until the end of August and we have people who are using the gyms now or who want to use the gyms now that we should respond quickly um, and if if all it really requires is a doctor's note um, then I think that would be um, a good thing for us to use um, Dan mentioned um, a doctor's note for people not to wear masks I think this is a much more critical 
um, element here that we help people to maintain their health. And if they think that using the gym in this kind of way is important, I think a doctor's note should be fine. So let me ask um, Milton, Dan, if either of you have any comments. I, I, I do have a comment. I, I, I would like Dan to start if he's out there. I guess Dan and I have talked about this a lot. And, and, and basically, we had a conversation before we even created, because if you remember, when we, when we first opened, we did not have designated hours for seniors. But if you remember when it, at one point, all the tracking was six, was for AC and seniors. And so Dan and I had the conversation about how can we accommodate that? And because the seniors were the most vulnerable group, and that was the group that all the studies were pointing to, and all the the test, all the case, and all the all the severity was right there. And so that's why we accommodated that. My biggest concern, and and and, and Dan is Dan deals with it every day. It's just that when we start mixing these groups together, albeit they may be declared vulnerable, I, I don't know what we're doing. Are we creating a, a, a bad situation by doing this as an, as an organization when we start having, okay, telling the seniors, you have this two, this two hour window, but now with the doctor's excuse, we can allow this person in here. We've even had a person that approached us about their child is autistic. They like to have a, a certain time when they can come. So it gets to the point where we just have all these special groups that we're trying to accommodate. Dan? Can I get in? Oh. Yeah, let's, let Dan talk and then. That is the, the challenge. And that's, you know, we, we, as Milton said, discussed this a lot with, with Dr. Oaken um, when we were originally planning this. Um, and uh, we, we've looked at it different times. And the, the, the challenge is um, once I start mixing the groups, I can no longer guarantee those 60 plus what they're getting anymore. Um, and so, you know, that's why we've held back because the, the, the feedback um, has been limited um, for, for those non 60 plus to use it. Uh, it hasn't been non-existent, but it's been very, very limited. Um, uh, you know, if, if this is something that we really want to do and the board is comfortable um, requiring a doctor's note um, would go a long way to, to making that happen. Um, I, I know from other circumstances, sometimes we have challenges with demanding people prove certain things. Um, and, uh, you know, so, um, but, but medical verification, and again, there's been cases where people show up with a note from their chiropractor saying they don't have to wear a mask and different things. Um, so it, it gets challenging to manage and it's just, no, I can no longer tell that 60 plus group that this is, this is what this is. It, it changes it. Um, and based on, you know, the conversation we had earlier, we have to be okay with that as well. Um, that it's no longer what, what it originally started out to be and what that group has expected it to be. Okay, Nancy and then Jenny. Uh, I, I thought I was in the I queue before Nancy. Yeah, Alan and, and Jeff. Jeff before oh, me. Go ahead, Alan. Go ahead, Alan. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I, I don't envy you on this one. Dan, because it is complicated. The uh, I would love to see. Well, first of all, I think I know with senior swim and so on, it's not just um, susceptibility to COVID, but it's it's vigor in the pool and all that. Somebody who's got diabetes, but who's otherwise pretty vigorous, a young man could be blowing people away and making life difficult for people swimming laps uh, during senior swim. Uh, and it wouldn't, you know, it would be hard to mix. I am, and I don't know, my first thought was, couldn't we just be flexible on this? I was remembering Doris when she was in her 90s and getting some special privileges because of the frailty of her skin so that she uh, could have a lane by herself uh, when she needed it and wanted it. And that was, you know, the rest of the swimmers just sort of accepted that, that she got some special perks, but that's a one-off. 
um, it's harder when there's a pandemic and it's, it's larger. So uh, I, I'm hearing both sides. I was, I was very sympathetic, Nancy, when you first wrote this. And then it just it almost is a no win. <clears throat> okay, Jess. So I sort of agree with Alan. I have no problem with putting it on the agenda, but I think it's a slippery slope. Um, so, you know, we can talk about it, but I don't know that there, that <coughs> I don't know that it's necessarily a, a good idea. So, but I'm fine with putting it on the agenda, but I don't think it should be urgent because I think it would require staff to really pull together some data so we can make some educated decisions about risk factors and all that kind of stuff. So I don't think it's something that we could do before that meeting in August. And if I would lo also love for us to have a conversation with Dr. Okin. Mm-hmm. Okay. Nancy and then Jenny. Uh, um, I, I think you make sense. I just would like to add, though, that this is a private membership. And I would like, I mean, I'm not pushing for this. I, I, I think that what you're requesting is more information and that's a good thing. I have no problem with that. But I do think that overall, it's not a bad thing like for Doris, if we were to make special People. arrangements for um, who come to us and ask, because frankly, this is the only ask I've heard. I don't know if anybody else has gotten any for any kind of special privileges of any sort about what's happening during this pandemic. This whole, this whole pandemic is a one-off, I hope, that will end hopefully in the next year or so. <clears throat> so I think maybe we need to be as mm -hmm. considerate and concerned about our members as we have ever been, or m much more so, because this is a very trying, difficult time physically and mentally for many of our members. And um, I think we should bend over if that, in triplicate if we have to, to make sure that we do as good a job and make them as happy Besides as possible. the fact that we need to keep these members happy because we want to make sure they all come back. Jenny? Yeah, um, when you first uh, presented this, Nancy, uh, when you sent us an email, I was uh, sympathetic. The more I'm thinking about it, um, diabetes, you know, what, what conditions, uh, and a doctor sometimes will sign a note um, just because he, he wants to do what his patient wants and just get it over with. I would really like to see our medical director give us some direction on what conditions we can put so it's not just I have a lung disease, I have um, uh, diabetes, uh, because I think we're going to then open up that that. 60-plus uh, time to a heck of a lot of people, frankly. And I would also be interested at in staff talking to the 60-plus uh, that are using it now as to whether or not they would have a problem with it uh, being open to younger people, and they would leave. So you got to get that balance. And I am really concerned that we could be opening something up. Uh, we used to call in legislation that you can drive a Mack truck through. So I would prefer that this be put on the agenda for further discussion with input from the doctor and other people, yeah. Okay, Janet's next. And then it looks like Dick. Um, I agree, I mean, I think if this were a one-off, then it would be a no-brainer, right? Um, but we have no idea the number of people that could potentially come forward um, that would request similar accommodations. And, and I'm, I'm not saying they wouldn't all deserve them because there are definitely um, risk factors. So I think we need to be really careful about how we um, decide to approach something like that. And I'm, I think I'm not in favor of them being in with seniors because that to me, um, you know, even if they are taking the same precautions, it just seems to me to create um, an additional risk. Um, but I, I would like to at least evaluate what we, what some potential options could be. Um, but I think with that in mind, it's not something that we can decide tonight. I think it's something that's going to require some research. So, thank you. Dick. Well, I, I think 
the consensus here is it would be nice if we could do this, but it's going to be a, a execution problem. And uh, so really, I think it's up, the, the staff knows how we feel, but I think they really have to figure out if this is something is practical or not. I got a little nervous when I heard the word chiropractors, uh, <laughs> you know, telling people that uh, they can, they don't have to wear a mask or whatever. And next thing you know, there'll be people saying they got bone spurs. So let's uh, be very careful. <laughs> handle. All right. Become our next president. Sherry <laughs> was... Shari's next. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I, I guess, um, I guess my experience is that um, people don't usually push um, these kinds of doors open. I this may really be a one-off um, in in asking for something like this. So I, I guess um, maybe I'm a little less suspicious. Um, than other folks, um, a little bit more sympathetic to somebody who is willing to um, to continue to to go to the gym because that's a very important part of their health regime. And I'm looking at it from a health and wellness perspective rather than than um, illness. Um, I do agree that we should probably get more information. I think that would make the the board feel more comfortable. Um, in, in terms of examining this and also creating a little bit of flexibility. Um, we are all in a situation right now where we don't even know if everything is going to be shut down in another month or two. Right. So, so you know, these hard and fast rules. Uh, one of the things I was going to ask Dan is, um, and I really don't know this, for the, the senior hour, do you check driver's licenses? I mean, what do you do? to make sure that the seniors who are coming in are seniors. We have their age in the system. Your what? We know your birthday. Your, your birthday. Oh, so, so, so if anybody, so if you anybody- You don't send me a present. <laughs> so if anybody didn't meet that requirement, but they showed up, would somebody at CA really stop them from coming in? Absolutely. I've seen it happen at the athletic club. Yes, they will. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Yes, they cannot come in. You know, the, the, the data, you know, and again, you know, as Alan said, and I said earlier when I was talking, there's no right answer to all this. You know, you're trying to like walk this really razor's edge of, you know, the fastest growing group with positive COVID cases is 35 to 50. So that's who we're going to be letting in with the 60 plus. And, you know, so you're trying to weigh that against Yes, I do want to help these people. Like Milton mentioned, the autistic, the young autistic girl. We worked it out where she had the face mask trigger, but we were able to get her to wear a shield. So we are working through accommodations, but it's just when you start mixing things together, like I said, you have the, the fastest group of COVID positive age group, and you start mixing in with the 60 plus, then I can no longer guarantee what I guaranteed the 60 plus before it changes that whole thing. And so it, it's, you know, damned if you do, damned if you don't. Yeah, I, I do understand the, the, um, this is a very, very tricky area, but I also think that if you can stop people at the door from coming in, you can also be much more firm about getting them to wear masks. Okay. I think we're, we're going to ask staff for more info. So let's move on. Anything else? Uh, well, technically, Andy, we should ensure that we have a majority of the board that wants oh. to add this to a future agenda. Oh, all right. Um, just a second. Let me. Thank you, Janet. Know. Yeah, I don't know that that's an official vote. It's an... Oh, well, I guess it isn't. Yeah, that would be a show of hands. We've done it as a show of hands. That's yeah. all um, we need. But I can't see all of you. <laughs> that's my problem. Oh. I can't see all of you right now. So we could put it on chat and say yay or nay. <laughs> Why do we Not do me. <laughs> Just ask if there's anyone opposed. Correct. <laughs> okay. I can see you all now. Thank you. Um, so as, as Renee said, is there anybody opposed to put this on a future agenda, the next agenda we come up with? No? All right. Okay. 
Anything else? If not, Can we're going I ask to talk for it. How far oh, in the future? I mean, this person would like to do this soon. Well, why don't you have this person contact Dan? Yeah. I mean, this it sounds like this is a one off situation. The board should not be discussing one off situations. Right. Yeah, you know, I mean But it, it's Dan, not a one off situation. But if it's I don't more know of a this one. Yeah. Okay. So for if, this if one, as long as Dan doesn't promise them the future, they can just say, for now, we're looking at it. Perhaps you, yeah. if the answer is yes, yes, you can, or you can't, but we're looking at it, whatever. Yeah. yeah. And the okay. decision may yeah. change. All right. Anything else? Talking points. Oh, sorry. Shari? Shari, you're on mute. Yeah, I would just like to um, capture, we looked at the IT situation tonight um, I would like to have some follow up. Yes, we're going to put it on an agenda. I, I think we need to do that sooner rather than later. And, and I'll ask yeah. the board if, if people feel that way. I mean, I think this is an important issue. We've been struggling with this for a while. If the question is coming up with parameters, um, then let's let's take a look at that. Yep. Yes, it's on the list here. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? All right. Talking points. Uh -oh. Hi, everybody. It's Bonnie. Hi, Bonnie. Uh, we have three talking points. Uh, there's a motion to approve the proposed budget schedule, approved unanimous, unanimously. Uh, there was also a motion to remove the lines regarding Mr. Raj on uh, lines 166 and 167 from the last um, set of minutes. And then the third one was a, a motion to um, put on a future ag agenda the question about allowing people under 60 um, with pre-existing conditions to uh, be al allowed to go to senior slotted event. Any discussion? All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate your taking all the time. Um, we're actually going to end seven minutes before the agenda said. So um, enjoy your weekend. And hearing no objection, we're adjourned. Thank you. Good night, Good night everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night.